Welcome to the first Zoom meeting of the JGS of Montreal. For those of you who are here in Montreal, we're sorry we can't see you face to face. For those of you who are watching from out of town, we welcome you and we're delighted that we have this opportunity to have you join us for the meeting tonight. Tonight is our annual three presenters meeting. And it's always been a feature presentation of our society enjoyed by all of us. And we're very delighted that so many more people will be able to watch it this evening or on YouTube in the future. So before we start, I would like to introduce Vicki Barkoff, who is going to give us a few technical details uh, for everybody to be aware of. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, if a question occurs to you while you're watching the presentation tonight, uh, you can type it or you can try to type it into the white chat box, which should be to the right of the YouTube video player. And you can type your question at the bottom where you'll see it says, say something, and then press the send arrow next to the box. Uh, there's a warning that, you know, you might have a problem with that and some suggestions about what you could do. I had no problem entering text, so hopefully you'll be as lucky as I was. And uh, if there's time at the end of the meeting, we will try to get to some of your questions. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Stanley. So I would like to start by introducing our program chair, Merle Kastner, uh, who will be also introducing each of our three presenters. And uh, I, I also want to ask everyone, as Vicki just said, if you've got questions, please do let us know. We'll try to address them. And sometimes we have some very interesting questions related to the presentations and please share them with us. So now over to Merle to introduce our speakers. Merle. <clears throat> Thank you, Stanley. <clears throat> Excuse me, can you, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, it gives me great pleasure. This is my final presentation after 20 years of doing programming, I'm now handing it over to someone else in our executive of our JGS. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers tonight. But first I have to remind everybody that the, we have a great affiliation with the Jewish Public Library after all the years that we have been in uh, in, in, in uh, observance, if you will. And uh, we owe them so much. They put us on their website. They put a link to us on their website and so on and so forth. So I just want everyone to know that we really, really appreciate that. Now, tonight, it great, gives me great pleasure to introduce Joanne Goldwater, who, you can see here, she is our first speaker. And then we have, uh, and Joanne has been a member of the JGS of Montreal for quite some time. Uh, and then we go to Alan Greenberg, who has been a member since practically just about the beginning of our existence. And that is really a wonderful thing, Alan. So thank you, Alan, and we're happy to have you here to speak to us tonight. And Joanne, we're happy to have you too. And lastly, tonight, we have Andreas Schwab, who is a great pal, and he has done some remarkable research, which he will share with us. He's also our secretary, and he does a heck of a lot for the JGS of Montreal, as does Alan. So we are delighted to have the three of you tonight. Uh, so take it away.
Joanne, it's uh, over yeah, to you. I'm not sure why something doesn't work here. Oh, here. Sorry about that. I'll get it. Here we are. Um, okay, we're in business now. I'm really excited to be here tonight because 2019 was a momentous year for me. I finally managed to visit Voskresensk a town which is 100 kilometers southeast of Moscow. And it's a town where my great uncle, this is him, Dr. Bear, Abraham Bear Kagan, was a very well-known doctor. And even 100 years after his death, he's still remembered with great love and great reverence. So he lived from 1870 till 1912. And he's noted in the town as to be a physician, educator, social activist and revolutionary. In 2015, a historian from the town, Svetlana Belus, made a 30 minute video about his contributions to modern medicine and public health. Svetlana, as well as other historians and researchers in the town have provided me with so much information that I never could have found on my own. And I really will be forever, ever grateful to them for that. This photo was sent to me by Svetlana and it's Abraham's graduation from medical school at the University of Moscow in 1893. Oh God. Sorry, something is wrong. This doesn't, oh dear. Sorry, I'm having a problem. My slide doesn't want to advance. What do I do? Joanne, I oh, think here. you still have it on the pointer. I don't know why it didn't advance. I'm sorry about that. This is the um, video cover from the, the um, DVD that Svetlana made about my great uncle. And as you can see in, in Russia, he used the name Boris Levovich, which, uh, Levovich is the patronymic, which means he was the son of Lev, and he was. And the name Kahan, uh, in Russian it was Kagan, but the name changed in English. Sometimes it was Kogan, it was Kagan, it was Kahan. And my grandmother's family chose the name Khan, K-A-H-N. I don't know why it doesn't. Sorry, I did this before and it advanced. I don't know why anybody have any ideas. I think you have to put it off your pointer back to your cursor That's each time I'm, you will want to advance. To, but it doesn't go back. The key Can you use come. an arrow key? The forward and back key should work. I wonder You're if somebody else should go and you come back to me. Do your arrow keys work? Yep. Oh, that's it. Okay. So I knew very little about this man when I was a kid. And I had very few things that, um, memories of him that my family had. So this was one photo. This photo was taken in 1901 in New York City. And I know it was 1901 because this is Abraham visiting his family in New York City. And these are his parents, my great grandparents, and my great aunts and uncles. Only my grandmother is missing because she was in Montreal. She had married my, my grandfather. So this is another document I had, which is a translation of the uh, funeral that occurred in 1912 when he died. And when I read this, I thought, well, he must have been quite important because the funeral procession was 40 miles long. And we can miss things sometimes. Here it says BL. And I 
missed that completely. I don't know if I thought it was something to do with the translation or what. So these were my steps in, in doing the research. I had looked in English and I never could find anything about him. One day I decided to transpose the name Abraham Kagan and Vaskersensk, the town, into the Cyrillic script. And I put that in Google and wow, all kinds of stuff came up. And that's when I realized that he was known as Boris Levovich in Russia. After that, I used Google Chrome to translate the web pages. And then I discovered that there was a monument, a street named after him, and there was a new plaque that was unveiled in 2012 on the side of the hospital. So my next step was to look for the web page for the municipality of Vasquez Sense. And um, I wrote to them and I told them who I was and that I was looking for information about my great uncle. Subsequently, a local historian named Alexander Suslov contacted me and we corresponded in Russian using Google Translate. And several years later, Svetlana Belus contacted me to make the video about him. Now, just a little review of the geography. The Khan family was from Zhad. Oh, the Khan family was from Zhagar, um, a small town on the border with Latvia. Uh, now, of course, it was in the Russian Empire then. They moved to Riga about uh, 1875, when Abraham was about five. So he went to the gymnasium there. Then they moved to Moscow. He went to medical school in Moscow and subsequently practiced in the town of Vaskodesensk here. And between 1908 and 1910, he worked in New York. He practiced in New York. And when he came back, he went to Columna, a nearby town. And he was only there a year and a half and he died at the age of 41 of typhus which the researchers told me he picked up, he found a woman sick on the street and he picked her up and carried her to the hospital and he got typhus from her. And they thought that he was rallying, but then he developed pneumonia and he died. And I think he was just really so overworked and exhausted. So finally, last Ju June, July, I took a trip to Russia. So the first part of my trip I went to St. Petersburg. I went with a group to St. Petersburg in Moscow. So I wanted to show you, this is the um, synagogue, the Grand Choral Synagogue in St. Petersburg. And that's the street that it's on. And this is the sanctuary here. Uh, as you see, there were a few men praying there. While I was in St. Petersburg, I met my cousin Arkady. Now, Arkady is a branch of the, from a branch of the Goldwater family, not the same family. His great grandmother was my grandfather's sister. They were exiled, as some of you historians might know that in 1915, the Jewish population of the Kovno province was deported into Russia. The Russians wanted to get them away from the front lines of the, of the war. So that's why this part of my family was in Russia. And it was such a wonderful thing to meet him. This is the second time I've met him. In Moscow, I went to the Grand Choral Synagogue there. Um, the weather was terrible in Moscow. It was pouring rain. And unfortunately, I only got there on Saturday morning on Shabbat. So I was able to go in, but no pictures. So finally, I went for three days to Vos Voskresensk. And a friend of mine from Florida, whose name is Ala, she was visiting Russia um, in the summer because she was visiting her family. And she and her son offered to go with me for three days to Voskresensk. So this is where we stayed. Uh, this building, part of it is a hotel. It's not all the hotels. Something like this part is the hotel. And this is a water sports complex painted blue with uh, dolphins in front, a fountain. So at the moment, there is no Jewish community in Vaskresensk. 
But we passed this ice arena and it, it's the Nikolai Epstein arena. It was built in 1966. Now, I was told that in the 50s and 60s, of course, there was a lot of anti-Semitism and many Jewish professionals and um, academics, whatever, they went to the smaller towns. So I guess that's why Nikolai Epstein came to Vaskresensk. And there are many very well-known hockey players come from this town and this arena. And the one we Montrealers know best is um, uh, mental block. Andre Markov. Andre Markov comes from here. So the first day when we got there for lunch, we met Svetlana Belus at the Chelsea pub. And this woman is fantastic. She arranged three days absolutely jam packed of meetings, activities, and all kinds of things. And the hospitality of the people in this town was so incredible, I cannot tell you. They really were wonderful. So the first event when I got there, this is Svetlana introducing the video that she made, so you can see it up there. Um, people came to see the video. After showing the video, they had tea for me. And again, the Russians always have lots of delicious food. This is my friend Ala from Florida who drove me and stayed with me and was partly interpreter. And this is Irina who was the official interpreter. And this lady is the director of the Culture Palace, which is where this event took place. And this man is Dr. Stanislav Ispolinov. And he's the director of the blood bank. Uh, the blood bank is located in the hospital where my uncle my great uncle built it up and modernized it and did all kinds of things there. So if you remember, I told you that um, the first person that contacted me from the town was Alexander Suslov. So unfortunately, he's had a stroke since I met him or I started corresponding with him. And his daughter, Katya, looks after him, takes wonderful care of him. But they insisted I go there for lunch because they wanted to meet me. And it was wonderful again, wonderful hospitality and lots of food. Here is another researcher, that, uh, an historian that has sent me information, Andre Frolov. Now, this picture on the left is taken on the shores of the Moscow River. And this is the actual spot where Abraham Bear was buried. On the right hand side, you see the original tombstone. This probably was taken in the 1930s or 40s because the stone was vandalized. First of all, someone stole the photo off the tomb and then somebody stole the, the stone itself, which was beautiful black marble apparently and polished it and reused it. And apparently, I think they know who it is but there's not much they can do about it. In the meantime, the town has put up another stone, but it's not in the original place of burial. Now, you see, this is a minor mistake that we genealogists have to watch for. It says 1871, and it's a mistake. You know, people made mistakes. He actually was born in 1870. Now, I told you there's a street named after him. Now, this is two photos together. This is, I guess, the original sign, which is quite old. And here is the newer sign, which you can see is very new. So I mentioned the hospital. This is the hospital that he modernized for that time and built all kinds of things that nobody else had before. At the time, the town was not Vaskresensk, it was called Krivyakina. So this is called the Krivyakina Hospital. Here you see Svetlana Belus who made the, the video. And this is my friend Ala and they're waving. They took me on a tour there and that was great too. So here, this is the side of the hospital with the plaque that was unveiled in uh, 2012, a hundred years after his death. It's enlarged here so you can see it. And this is Dr. Stanislav is Kolonov, and he is really doing a lot to try to preserve whatever remains of the memory of Abraham Bear Kagan. 
uh, this is the monument that has been up for a while. I'm not sure when it went up. And it's actually a little away from the hospital building. So Dr. Espolonov is trying to get it to be moved closer to the building. Now, this is a photo that Svetlana sent me, and it's actually the Zemtsvo in 1912. And since Abraham died in February 1912, I have to assume that this is very, you know, very close to the time he died. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to read it. The Encyclopedia Britannica says the Zemtsvo was the organ of rural self-government in the Russian Empire and Ukraine. Their function was to function to provide social and economic services. It became a significant liberal influence within Imperial Russia. So I was shocked by this picture, the third from the left sitting, because he had aged so much. I'd never seen a photo of where he looked anything like that. Uh, he was 41, almost 42 at the time. So in this photo, we have something interesting too. This man is Dr. Israel Yosefovich Salzburg. And he was my great uncle's best friend, colleague, and he did the eulogy at his funeral. And I really would love to try to find this, his descendants, but so far I haven't been able to. I could show you just in case anybody has any ideas. These are photos of Dr. Salzburg that they sent me. So this is the earliest one here. He's with two nurses and two patients. And here, probably a little later, he's with a nurse and a patient. Now this one is maybe the most interesting because it's written the date, 1923, and it's in Ramenskoy, which is a town in between Voskresensk and Moscow. So he obviously was working there. So my trip to Russia, that's all I have time for because I, I don't have too much time. I could speak forever about it probably. My trip to Russia was a fantastic learning experience and the hospitality of the people was just amazing. So if you take one thing away from this presentation, I think you should take your genealogy trips when you can. Don't put it off because this is 2020. If I hadn't taken it, it last year, the year of COVID, there's no way I would be able to travel. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, you please submit them in the chat, chat box. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, Merle, do you want to introduce the next speaker? You have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes, now we have Alan Greenberg. And whatever Alan says, he's so knowledgeable. I'm sure it will be wonderful. Go ahead, Alan. All right, thank you very much. Am I unmuted? I still see Merle's picture up there. You're unmuted, Alan. There's a 20 second delay. Just ah, do sorry. your stuff. I'm not, wasn't aware of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Today's talk, let me share the screen. Thank you. Today's talk will be on uh, sources for Canadian genealogy, sources and techniques. If I can figure out how to. Oh, dear. Okay. Um, I've been doing genealogy for about 28 years, and that started at a time when you actually had to travel to archives uh, and turn your hand continually on microfilm readers. Things are a little bit easier right now. The, the records that are most useful to start genealogy research in Canada 
our census records, immigration records of various sorts, and naturalization records. And I'll be talking today about each of these and sharing a little bit of what, about what you find in them and the techniques to work your way through them. So census records are the first ones we'll be looking at. Uh, census records in Canada go back to 1825. That's before Canada existed. Uh, so they were upper and lower Canada or east and west Canada, depending on what year it was. Uh, they're available at a number of places. Library and Archives Canada has the full set of records and they're all indexed. Uh, they use, in fact, the indexes from Ancestry, which we'll be talking about in a second. The second source, which is worth knowing about that very few people look at, is an organization called Automated Genealogy. They only have in uh, census records primarily for 1901 and 1911, but their indexes are far better than anyone we've, anything we've seen on the large commercial services, and it's free. And lastly, Ancestry and a whole bunch of other fee-based services uh, have most of the uh, census records from Canada. And of course, in, 19, in 2023, two years from now, the 1931 census will be released. Those of you doing US history uh, might be interested in knowing that in a year or so, the 1950 census from Canada, from the US will be released. So first we'll look at the 1911 census and we're looking at some records from for my one of my grandfather's brothers, Moisha Haimovich. And you can see the record there. Uh, Moisha, his wife, his son, Abby, his other son, Joseph, Rebecca, who's his mother, and Gertie, his sister. And if you look at what, how automated genealogy interpreted it, you'll see they got it pretty good. Uh, they have all the names exactly right. Uh, and they even spelt the uh, Moisha in the French way, because you'll notice on the record, it's not spelled Moisha, it's Moise, it's French, just as the other words on the record, the chef, epous, the months of the year are all, all in French, because the census taker was in French, what was French speaking, and wrote it all in French. But you see, automated genealogy got it pretty well right. So. If, if I had looked for it there, I would have found it right away and no problem. Let's look at how Ancestry took, did it. Now that's the record, same record, and this is how Ancestry indexed it. Now you'll notice a number of things. First of all, Haimovich, and it's very clearly V-I-T-C-H in the record, the person's, person wrote V-I-T-Z. Why? Not a clue. Now, Moisha may be somewhat confusing, but I don't know how they got Marie out of it. Hmm. But that's what they got. And notice we have Marie married to Clara. Now, I don't think there were a lot of same-sex marriages in 1911. But no one seemed to really care about that. Now, the next one is interesting. Abby became Roy. Now, how could Abby possibly become Roy? Well, it's actually quite simple. If you look at this little part here and pretend it's a descender of this character, like as if this was a Y, and take it off, erase that little loop, then it looks like an OY. And that is reasonably an R. Once you believe that's OY, that could easily be an R. So Roy is reasonable. Unfortunately, they had interpreted this as Clara and there is no descender in Clara. So it makes no sense at all. Joseph somehow became Joe. Again, that's clearly an S, there's no way it's an E. And lastly, notice Abby was born in Rhode Island. Well, Abby was born in the province of Quebec. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at the records around this, there are a lot and a lot of people born in Quebec. Normally they just put a Q, just this letter here, and they interpret it as a Q. But somehow the census taker, I guess he was starting to write Russia because the other ones were born in Russia and he scratched it out and made it into a P or maybe he just scratched it out altogether and wrote a Q, but somehow the person interpreted that as Rhode Island. So I now had a 
second cousin born in Rhode Island, according to this. Now, for my father's side, my father was Jack, Jacob, Jake to his family, middle name Moses. His, his parents were Louis or Laser, L, short for Eliezer, and Edith. And at the time in 1911, he had a brother, Willie. So that's the record. Now, you can see clearly the census taker did something wrong here. We don't know what. He got Louis right. Uh, Edith, Edith. Now, you have to remember. These were typically, this was in Ottawa, but it was also a French Canadian census taker listening to someone with a heavy European accent. So you just have to imagine whatever the census taker heard, he wrote and spelt it the way he thought it should be spelt. So it's sometimes amazing you got anything right. Willie, well, I guess it's Willie once you know it's Willie. And here's my father. Now, I said, my father was Jack, Jacob, maybe Jake to his family. He became Jacques. Again, exactly what was said, we don't know, but the, the census taker either heard it as Jacques or decided that she'd spell it out in full and Jacques was the right way to spell Jack. Who knows? All right, so let's look at what ancestry got. We have Louis Greenberger. Where's the ER? Not a clue. And Edith, that's pretty much what it looks like, actually. And they got Willie. I'm not sure I would have written Willie here. And Jock became Jackius. Guess it's believable. That's a Y. Not sure how that's an S, but so be it. That's what they got. Now, let's see what happened in 1921, the next census. By that time, my father's two twin sisters, Ida and Sarah, were born. And we have Louie. It's Edith sort of getting mixed up by the Greenberg. Greenberg got squished. Willie is nice and clear in this time. And Jacob M. and Ida and Sarah. So let's see what ancestry made of this, or at least the, the person reading the records for ancestry. Well, we have Louis Granberg. Well, it's believable that those two E's could be read as an A. I'm willing to accept it. Edith, that's good. <laughs> Willie, I thought was clear, but apparently not to this person. So if I had been searching for Willie, no chance I would have found it. And Jacob M, Ida and Sarah, pretty good. Now, one of the questions you might think of is how do you find names knowing that in many cases, they're going to be mangled? And the answer is, well, in this case, a simple search for Louis Greenberg and using a wild character for the, for the vowel would have found it. Or in ancestry, you can say, ah, it's not quite exactly the name, but it's something like this and would have found it. But in some cases, you'll find that it just doesn't work that way. So here's an interesting technique you can use. Uh, work doesn't work, it works with ancestry, doesn't work with some other systems. But in this case, if you had done a search or I had done a search for Louis, no last name at all, not even gonna to try to guess how they interpreted it. And two children, Jack, only put the first three letters. So that covers Jacob, Jack, Jacques, and Sarah. And you never know if they have an H or a, a not on Sarah. And if you'd done a search like this, it would narrow it down pretty quickly to the right family. So you have to do innovative things with combinations. Sometimes you'll, you can look for the, for instance, if, if you can't find the child, but the parents' names are unusual, you could just search for the two parents' names here and you may find it even without a surname. So all sorts of little tricks you can play to try to get the system to find things that are otherwise not findable. And it usually works, but not always. This is one, as some of you may know, I get requests from people around the world uh, looking for families in Montreal. And in this case, they were looking for a family that might have been Kosowatsky or maybe Kostovetsky, some name like that. So I tried automated genealogy, nothing. Ancestry, nothing. 
So I was really stuck. How can I find a name that's a complex name? It's not likely to have been written properly and it's not likely to have been read properly. So what do I do? Well, in this case, Montreal makes things very easy. Montreal has had city directories since the middle of the 1800s and they're all available, they're online and they're free. They're all at the uh, library of the uh, Quebec National Archives. So this is what I did. I tried searching for the city directories. Now city directories have a lot of names on a single page. So although I didn't quite know how Kosowetsky, Kosowitsky, whatever was spelled, I just went to the page with KOSs. I also tried COSs, of course. And it was pretty easy to, kind, to find Sam Kosowetsky, close enough. Um, I knew it was his name was Sam. I didn't know the name of the children at the time. But now I see he lives at 561 St. Lawrence. So the next trick is you now go to the street index and you try to find someone else on the same side of the street. Because remember, census takers walk down one side of the street and up the other. And in most cases, you have even numbers on one side odd at the other. That's not the case in earlier censuses in Montreal. Before they renamed the streets, there were some cases where the, the numbers went up one side and down the other with even and odd mixed. But in this case, we already had even and odd on either side of the street. So you're looking for someone else who lives on the same side of the street with a name that is gonna be almost impossible to miss. That is the census taker will likely have spelt it right and the person reading it will likely have gotten it right. And in this case, notice there was a Charles Sherman who happened to live at the same address as Sam Koswatsky. So I did a search in the census for Charles Sherman. And sure enough, there's Charles Sherman and there's Kosowatsky. They got the name spelled better than Lovell's directory did. And we have Sam, Fanny, his children, Joseph, Morton and Morris. Okay, so now that I knew that it was there and I could find it, I could now go and look at who else is on that page. That's one of the things Ancestry lets you do. And here's the end index that I found. This is how Ancestry had indexed it. Sam Cosinatelli. Okay, now a couple of things come out of that. There's no possible way anyone would have guessed that. But if you look at it and go back here, Cos, so that could be an N, that could be an A, that's a T, an A, and here we have the page was folded. And that could easily, it was a K, but it could easily be a T, and that little thing with a dot could be an I. So you can imagine how the person got, got it, but there's no way you would have found it by trying to look up the name. All right, next thing we're gonna look at is ship arrival records. Well, here's the ship arrival for my, my grandfather, Joseph Heimovich. You ready? Now I'm not gonna tell you how I found it yet, but here's the record. And the third entry that's showing here is indeed the, uh, the arrival record for my grandfather, Joseph Heimovich. Now Heimovich, you can understand. Wochen? How could that possibly have come for there? Well, the answer is not that much of a mystery. If you look at the naturalization record for Joseph, and he was naturalized in 1922, here's the, one of the pages from the naturalization, naturalization application that he filled out. And we're looking at Joseph Heimovich, that is indeed where he was living. He came from Kishinev. He was a Russian white. He was born in, 18, in May of 1890. So that's the right person. And it says he arrived from Russia via Liverpool under the name Nathan Heimovich. 
Now, Nathan was his brother. Nathan actually went to Argentina and then didn't like it there and came to New, went to New York, New York. But he went to New York. So how did that happen? Well, apparently the ticket was purchased for Nathan and then used by his brother. Nobody had passports in those days, or at least many didn't. So Nathan, Joseph, it's all the same. That doesn't, still doesn't explain Vochum. Well, here's the certification from the Immigration and Colonization Department certifying he arrived as Vochum Haimowitz, a joiner. Well, he was a furrier here. I guess he left off woodworking when he left. Age 15. and arrived again on the right date, the right ship. So how do you get Vochum? Well, what was likely written was Nuchum. Now you have to think, these arrival records, the rumors used to be that the arrival records were written at Ellis Island or in Halifax. They weren't. They were written before the ship departed. And the names there came from the tickets. Now, someone who lived in Kishinev spoke Russian, Yiddish, might have spoken Romanian. The family had come from Romania a generation or two before, so they might have spoken Romanian. There's a good chance that they didn't use Latin characters at all. If they spoke Romanian, they might have used Latin characters. So if you think about what does an N look like, well, an N looks an awful lot like a V with another stroke. If you write this first stroke very close to the first one, ends become V's. And suddenly, no, Joseph Haimovich traveling under his brother's name, Nuchem Haimovich becomes Volchem Haimovich. It all makes complete sense. Last cup, last record. My other great grandfather, great grandfather, Leon Lusgarten. Now we were always told Leon was a name he adopted here. That turns that not true. Uh, his ship arrival record shows he's Leon. He had moved from a little town in Romania to Bucharest. And when you're in the big town, you don't want to use Yiddish names of Leib, and it became Leon. Here's a record I found for him. Now, it's an interesting record. It's a cross-border record saying he was examined uh, actually in Montreal in preparation for going to the U.S. And a number of interesting things on it. First of all, 52, his age is 52. Well, he was actually closer to 60. He was born in 1863, but as soon as he came to Canada, all Canadian records say he was born in 1870 or 1869. No idea why. All we can guess is maybe he thought if he was too old, he wouldn't be let in or something. So he became younger. And his tombstone also reflects his Canadian age, not his real age. So suddenly he became young. Next thing, born in Bucharest. No, he wasn't. He was born in Batashan in north, northern, northeastern Romania. But he lived in Bucharest for a while. Maybe it was better to say he came from there. Who knows why? And the last interesting thing is he was going to visit his sister Betty Greenberg in Detroit. I had never heard that he had a sister or a sister Betty. I knew about several brothers in the US. I knew about a brother in Manchester that I've never been able to find, but nobody ever mentioned a sister. <coughs> so still haven't been able to find her. I've looked for all sorts of records in Detroit for Greenbergs, have not been able to find Betty or anything resembling a Betty, but somewhere, well, someday I'll find a record for Betty Greenberg. Uh, the address should be enough to find it but I haven't found a city directory for that period of time yet that could help narrow down what who her husband was. And that's about it. Here's a number of URLs for all of the um, records. I assume this presentation will be on our website and you can pull them all off. Uh, it's all there floating around on the internet now, most much of it for free. And uh, I wish you all luck in trying to find your family. Thank you. And back over to whoever I'm turning it back over to. Merle. And now 
Uh, with great pleasure, Andreas Schwab. But thank you, Ellen. That was very, very helpful. Very, very interesting. And I'm sure that it will be, it will push a lot of people forward in the research. Thank you. Andreas. Thank you, Merle, for inviting me to, the, to speak tonight. And tonight I will speak about my trip to Germany and what touched me when I went there. So let me get the first slide here. Um, So, welcome to the town of Ermetshofen, which is a lovely Bavarian town, halfway between Frankfurt and Munich, with a nice steeple. That's how you imagine a Bavarian town to look like, but it's, it's interesting, a Protestant town and not Catholic like most of Bavaria. And here we are, myself, my sister, Johanna and uh, my brother-in-law, sorry, Christian and Friedrich Dehne. He's the keeper of the Jewish cemetery. So a few more pictures. It happened to be Thanksgiving day and the children had made this beautiful basket for us for celebrating Thanksgiving. This is one of the Jewish houses. And guess why are there these, these holes on the side of the, the door? Of course, <laughs> you know it was where the mezuzah was. <laughs> Interesting, many of the houses in Emmetshofen have these twin windows. And I was told that these two windows represent the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. So Friedrich Dehmer made the two uh, letters to a tour through the town. And here we are at the cemetery. Again, my sister, I'm in the middle, and Friedrich Dehmer on the left. You see at the left, there's the Tahara house. That's the inside of the Tahara house. Now let's go back again here. You see, all the graves are on the top because the graves started here earlier, but all these tombstones have been stolen. So only the newest tombstones are there. Here you see the many graves, all from the 19th century. And I want to focus on these two tombstones here. One is for Janetta Schwab and the other for Justine Schwab. What you see here, they have, each of them has a broken column and the broken column symbolizes a life that was ended too early. So who were these two women? Let you show me my family tree here. So at the left, you see my paternal grandma, grandfather, Josef Schwab. And he was the only one in, the, in my ancestor who was actually Jewish. He was Jewish, he was born Jewish, he had his bar mitzvah, everything. But then he met Marie Kögelmeier, who was of Bavarian Catholic descent. My mother was Greek, but I have a maternal um, uh, grand, great grandmother on the maternal side who was French Protestant. So let's focus on Bernhard Schwab and Justine Schwab ne Rosenfeld. But first, I want to make a little detour and go to Jakob Schoenfeld, born in 1825. He married Therese Bernheimer in 1857 in Emmetshofen. But Therese died in 1858. So Jakob married again in 1859. He married Janet Scheidt, that was the woman, the woman with the gravestone at the right, in 1859. And, but then in 1860, Jakob died. Now Janet, now Janet was a, a widow. She was the widow of a widower. She married again. She married my grandfather in 1861, they had one child, 
Max in 1862, and then in 1863, Jeanette died at the age of 26. So my great grandfather Bernhard, he married again in 1864. He made it a 21, 21 year old young woman, and they had together, they had four children. Joseph, which is my great, my grandfather, died in 1940. He was lucky because he was not deported. It was before the deportation had started. Siegfried Hugo, who died in the year he was born. Actually, he, he died, I think he was about a month old, and Willibad, 1870. And shortly after Willibad died, Justine died. So we have, of the 10 people you have on this chart, after 1870, there were only five left. So we're talking about the Corona virus today, about COVID and how many people died. In the 19th century, that was the norm. People died all the time, but still, it's so sad to see that my great grandfather married twice and both his wives died at this early age. Recapitulate. Recapitulate. 1870, 57. Marriage of Jacob and uh, Therese. Therese died in 58. 59, he married Jeanette. 60, now Jacob died. 61, Jeanette married Bernard. 62, Max was born. 63, Jeanette died. 64, Bernard married Justine. 65, my grandfather was born. 66, another child was born. 68, Hugo was born, died in the same year. In 70, Willy Balschwaf was born. Jeanette died and Bernhard moves to Würzburg to live with his mother. His mother died at the age of 92 and Bernhard died two years after his mother. So back to the tombstones. And so this is Jeanette's tombstone and every tombstone has a Hebrew inscription on the, on the Eastern side and a German inscription on the Western side. So here's the Hebrew inscription. And what you see here is, this is an acrostic poem, meaning that every line of the poem starts with a letter and together the letter gave the name, the Jewish name of my, the, my step great grandmother, which was Sprinzler. Now Sprinzler is a Sephardic name. It's derived from the Portuguese Esperanza, which means hope. So uh, Jeanette had three names, Sprinzler. She was also uh, Ruth here. Yeah? No, who is Ruth? <laughs> Um, and uh, was her Hebrew name, and uh, no, uh, sorry, Rachel. Ra Rachel. <laughs> and uh, Spitzler. And if you look at the translation, the respected woman of Vela, and she waved uh, like an apple her fruit more than pearls, her lips have been anointed, and so on. It's, it doesn't sound not very familiar, but if you know your, your Torah, where is it? Here it is. So far more than pearls is from Proverbs 31.10. Her lips have been anointed, the Psalms 45.3. She will be named woman because she was taken from a man. Now that's interesting. Where is that from? What do you think? Very easy answer. That's of course from Genesis because Eve was created from a rib of Adam. Here you go. Genesis 2.23. She will be named woman because she was taken from a man, which of course, if you read it in Hebrew, I can't read Hebrew, but you see the the, the you have here Asha, 
for a woman. And uh, where is it? Yes, in here. Ash for for the for the men. And oh, now we come to the German side, and here we have a German name, which of course is a French name, and also an acrostic poem. Still young of age, friendly and gentle, you sped from us a lovely image. When the angels of happiness and joy were approaching you after many sufferings, when a husband was loving you, a little sun blossoming for you, it sounded from above, depart now in peace. A dream, alas, a love and pain on earth. Only in heaven does peace come into her. So this is what my great grandfather, in with his love, um, uh, arranged to have on the tombstone of his first wife. And of course, his second wife, which was my great grandmother, is similar. Again, you have the acrostic poem here. This time, for the for the name of Yentil. Well, I don't know what Yentil, where it comes from. It's also very well known. Jewish name, but his her, her name in 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 reality was Sarah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was her, her Hebrew name. So Yentil Sarah and uh, what happens here? Uh, so this is the translation again, and again you can see. We have a lot of <laughs> Torah citations here. The her heart, she was happy mother of the children. She was living in tents. Was my great grandmother living in a tent? Of course not, but it is from Judges 5.24. It was Jael who was living in the tent. <laughs> Strength and dignity are her clothing from Proverbs 3125. To the poor, she stretched out her hand, also from Proverbs. And finally, her light will not be extinguished. It will be shine for her husband and her home. Again, from Proverbs, she sees that the trading is profitable and her lamps does not go at, off at night. So beautiful poetry, but all put together from the Bible, from the Torah. And this is now the German side, and it says Frau Justine Schwab here. Frau Justine Schwab. It's not exactly acrostic it because it's not the first name, and you can see it here. The letters that count for the acrostic are bigger. The F and the R is bigger than the A. You see, the U is bigger than the S here, especially the SCH, so acrostic point. So these are the two tombstones. And at the end, before I go, I will show you another stone. Well, <laughs> sorry, I have to, for first, I show you the translation, a woman's virtue, love, faith, and gentleness, youth and grace adorned your glance. Quiet was your ambling in the fields. On the side of your husband and among your children, you found your happiness. Painful, our tears flow because the universal father has called you away from us. All what is good, dear, and beautiful remains forever engraved your image deep in our heart. And to end, this is the tombstone of Hugo the child. Now you will ask, how do I know that it's his stone? Because there's no inscription. There's the inscription, but it has sunk it to the, to the ground. Well, there's, there's the, the burial list which, list which has been uh, somehow... Uh, preserved and I just counted the graves and this is his tombstone. So this is what I found when I went to Germany and I was so touched and it is so, it's so sad, but on the other hand, such a, a, a expression of love that I found in Hermitshofen. Thank you, Merle, and thank you for listening to me. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, before Merle and, and Stanley finish, uh, we do have, I think we have time for some, a few questions. Uh, one from the floor here, and if any, anybody else has questions, this is your, your 
big chance to type them in now. Um, this is a question for Alan about um, ship arrivals. The question is, were there any European ships that arrived in Quebec via New York City? I guess, would they have docked first in New York and then come to, to Quebec? Um, I don't really remember. Certainly there are many yeah. ships that would go to Halifax, Quebec City and Montreal. Uh, but I don't, I don't think typically the ships that went to New York also came to Montreal. I, I'm not saying there, there weren't any that might have done that, but uh, I'm not aware of any. Yeah, okay. Um, Stanley, are you aware of any? No, uh, I'm not. Uh, that, in, it's, yeah. an inter it's an interesting question, but I don't think it would have been practical because yeah. of the way in which the tickets were sold. Uh, the, it, and, and, and the extra length of the trip. Remember, the, the trip was probably, uh, you know, a week, te uh, 10 days, two weeks. Um, and so making it even longer didn't sound like something that would be attractive to immigrants, even if they were in steerage. Right, right. Uh, it, it's Alan again. Um, I, I'm reminded of when I first started traveling to the US, I, I worked for a while in Chicago and Kansas City, and I would fly there on uh, either British Airways or Air France, because they had flights going from Europe to Montreal to Chicago because there wasn't enough traffic going to Montreal to justify a whole flight. And mm -hmm. eventually, of course, that cut out because the traffic picked up. I can't imagine that there not being enough traffic to New York City, so they'd also tack in a couple of, of Montreal or Halifax visitors. So mm -hmm. I doubt if those were, uh, were split up like that, whereas Halifax, Montreal, and Quebec City make a little bit more sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Joanna, a, a quick question for you. Can you unmute yourself, please? Or, or uh, Marilyn, can you unmute her? Okay. Um, yeah, it's a quick question. You mentioned that you started your research on uh, your ancestor, the doctor, uh, by transcribing his name into Cyrillic. And did you use Google Translate to do that? Or do you know this? Are you familiar enough with the Cyrillic alphabet that you did it oh, yourself? I use Google Translate. I use it a lot. And it's amazing what you can do because now you can even photograph a document. Let's say you have a Xerox copy, which is like a photograph. You can translate that using Google Translate. It's unbelievable right. what you can do now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, there's a comment here. Uh, somebody has commented that people usually went by train from Montreal to New York. I don't know when those trains started though and what period we're talking about here. Um, but uh, I guess it would, would have been more likely once the train service started for people to go by train um, between those two places. Uh, okay, and... Um... Uh, Mickey, let me just comment on that. Um, one of the uh, attractions of coming to Montreal and then taking the train onward either to New York or Chicago or Detroit was that the that CP uh, ships made a very special offer to attract people and they provided a through ticket so that you actually went from the boat to the to, to the train and you see that in the border crossing records so right. that explains i think part of the reason you see uh i think in one year and alan you can correct me i think in one year more than a million people came through canadian ports and went on to the united states do you remember that alan I don't remember the number, but certainly at, at, at various times, uh, it was easier to get entry into Canada for people than the US. So instead of being held up in New York and turned back, they would come into Canada and then go by train to the, to the US. Um, and tickets were also at some points cheaper. So people would simply come here because the ticket was only $4 instead of $5 across the ocean or whatever the numbers were at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so you find a number of things. In the earlier years, you also find a lot of people going to New York and then coming to Canada. Uh, you know, so it, it went both ways and it varied depending on the year. Yeah. Uh, I have two points. I know that the train was going from New York to Montreal around 1900 or just shortly after 1900 because I had relatives in New York City, the cons that I was talking about, and they came back and forth to Montreal. And something else about the border crossings, well, about immigration, I had two cousins that were in Hamburg. Actually, they were the children of this doctor. And in the 20s, they were headed to New York to, for the fa to see the family there, to, to live with the family there. And the US closed the border. So they had to come to Montreal where they had my grandmother. They couldn't go to the States. That was in the 20s that the border was closed. Entry, yeah. Uh, somebody here has written, my grandfather sailed from Le Havre, France to New York in 19... 29, and then traveled by train to Montreal via Rouse's Point. So uh, that was a possible route. And that may have been a more convenient way to find a boat uh, to get to Montreal. Uh, you know, the same way that Air Transit was flying from Montreal to Bordeaux, but wasn't flying from from Newark, so my American cousins, uh, every summer going to Bordeaux to visit the family, they would come to Montreal. You know, it's a natural way to find your route that is most convenient. Mm. Yeah. Re remember, immigration rules at that period for both Canada and the U.S. were getting really nasty, and uh, they they were doing their best to not allow people in. Uh, so. You know, it, 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 it varied, you know, based on your race and religion and color and things like that. But it uh, it, it was pretty nasty. So in many cases, people were, went wherever they could and then possibly tried to find their way to somewhere where there, there was a relative. Typically, people came to an, a city because they had some relative there and it didn't have to be a really close relative. Uh, as far as I can tell, the the Lust Gardens that I mentioned in my family, in my uh, presentation came from New York to Montreal because his wife had a distant cousin here, <coughs> something like that. So. Uh, mute, Merle, there. Um, so uh, what else? Yes, Andreas, a question for you. Uh, those, those tombstones are amazing. Has anyone ever thought of unearthing little Hugo's stone? I'd be very mm. curious to know what's on it. Uh, the cemetery is under protection. It's, it's, it's considered a monument and nobody can touch it without permission from the Bavarian government. When, uh, when the, the German side was very dirty, was full of lichen, first time I went there, so I had it cleaned, but the, it was one of the stone masons in the region who cleaned it, and he had to get permission, so you can't touch this. And I think that it's also not, it's not halacha to, um, to maybe. unearth a, a fallen stone. It has to stay as it is. That's what I heard, I'm not Jewish, I don't that's, know. No, uh, that's very possible. Uh, we have a few comments here. Uh, we have a comment from DK Montreal. Congratulations, Merle, and thank you. Um, we have uh, some comments. All three presenters were great from Aria Schiffman and uh, from someone named Sweet Tooth. Thanks everyone, very interesting presentations. Uh, are there, if there are no more questions, I'm looking so far. That seems to be it for the questions. So uh, I guess over to you, Stanley. Oh, th <clears throat> thank you, Vicki. <clears throat> and thank you to our presenters. Merle, thank you for a yeoman job over so many years. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. And let me start by saying, or repeating what I usually say following the three presenters. Everybody comes at this evening from a different point of view with a different kind of story 
and we always learn something. And I think that we all learned something this evening. Uh, particularly thinking about Joanne and uh, Andreas making that in you know that incredible trip to visit countries, talk to people, meet people, make discoveries. Uh, I have personally done that uh, in the early years in Poland in 1995, 1996. And these are irreplaceable memories and stories that we that I brought back and that they have brought back that are stories to pass on to future generations. Whether you write them, whether you record something, but very important to capture the moment. And that is such a important part of that visit to the foreign country. Uh, Joanne, I, I, I must say that, that you were blessed with the connections you made. And it speaks for the power of networking. You plant the seed, you write a letter, you send out an email, you translate something from Russian and you keep going. And the more you reach out, the more you make contacts, it comes back to you. It's like putting your name in the Jewish gen family finder or the family tree of the Jewish people. Years ago, when before the internet, uh, what we said, I say we being genealogists, we said for those women who immigrated from the old country, make sure you put your maiden name in the phone book so people can find you. And that is such an important part of doing family history research is to find, to look and help people find you. Putting photographs on the internet, titled photographs so that people can come across them by accident. Uh, all these things work and so Joanne, uh, you know, uh, seeing that, that, that um, you know, the, the remarkable photographs that you brought back, and the quality that they showed you, and the fact that they knew in their hearts without probably expressing it, that you were carrying back some great stories to Canada as a result of your trip to, to, to Russia. And people do bend over backwards to be hospitable. In smaller towns, it is highly usual to see that kind of thing. Maybe not as much in the larger towns, <coughs> but uh, you certainly are a beneficiary from that kind of reception and bringing back those memories. Uh, Alan, what can I say about Alan? Uh, he's the go-to guy when you really want to be creative about genealogical research. And uh, those people who over the years have contacted Alan for research, uh, contacted the, uh, used the email address on the JGS of Montreal website and uh, were answered by Alan. And then thank you, all those people. And if any of you are watching who made donations to help us continue to do the work that we're doing. And we have major projects underway for which we need funds and donations. But this is not meant to be a, uh, a fundraising pitch. I, I just go back to what I was saying about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the creativity that Alan showed. And what really was evident was the terrible, terrible indexing that was done by Ancestry. Uh, and a good example of that is that when the JGS of Montreal fully extracted all the vital records of Quebec from 1841 to 1942, uh, we actually looked, and I'm say we, it's my wife did a lot of that work, uh, looked at those same records four separate time to refine and to improve. 
And one of the things that you don't see in ancestry or any other source is somebody taking a name and saying, I can't read this and then going to other sources, going to Quebec marriage records, going to Quebec death records to actually clarify what that birth record might have said in, in 1910. And we did that. We went to that extra step. So if you're using Ancestry to search the Jewish records of Montreal, uh, you may want to keep that in mind in order to get a, another view. Another thing to keep in mind, and, and it's really relevant, and I, pardon me for taking some time and talking about it, is the fact that with the database that we have and our ability to manipulate that database, we can often find the original name of a family where it has been a mystery. Again, by using the technique that Alan was talking about, taking multiple given names from family members and looking for where those given names correspond to a, a surname that is likely the one for the family. Uh, Andreas, I, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, uh, seeing these two small windows at the apex of the house uh, and the fact that these represent the, um, the, the tablets, uh, it's something that I didn't know, and that's what I say. Every presentation, we learn something, and I will not forget that one when I look at any photograph of a house in Eastern Europe. Um, I'm gonna, in fact, I'm going to actually look a little harder and deeper in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, I, I think it's important to mention that a lot of your research reflects the remarkable record keeping uh, in the German cities and, 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 and provinces. The fact that you've got such incredible records that you're able to tap as you develop your family history. And I can't end without mentioning the remarkable gravestones and those poems uh, the way in which somebody was honored uh, in, in, in death this way. We've all seen gravestones, different places that have something that's written that we may not be able to read, uh, particularly you know, in, the, in the Warsaw Cemetery, when you have gravestones that are, <coughs> that are 15 feet high and 20 feet wide. Um, but you're introducing those to us was also a revelation and for which I thank you. So let me end by saying that this has been a very rewarding evening for me and I think and I think I think for all of us because we know the amount of work that went into it by Andres, by Alan, by Joanne, and we want to express our appreciation once more for their efforts at entertaining and educating us. So we look forward to seeing you again at the next meeting. We look forward to seeing you at our workshops and we look forward to networking with you in the future. Thank you all and good night.